Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another lecture in the Music 1300 series. Today, we are discussing um, our first venture into harmony. Um, we've just talked a lot about form and structure in music, how certain ideas repeat. Um, so, so far, we, we've actually talked about three really broad stroke uh, ideas um, that are contained in within a piece of music. Um, first and foremost, we talked about well, actually we've talked about uh, four rather than three, but uh, first we've talked about texture, um, how many different independent layers are ongoing in a piece of music at one given time. Uh, we've also talked about rhythm, uh, the metric construct of a piece of music and how that changes throughout history, or at least the preference uh, given to per, uh, particular uh, rhythmic ideas and constructs throughout history. Uh, we've also talked about instrumentation, different combinations of instruments together to create ensembles. Uh, we trace the development of a, a, a number of ensembles, notably the string quartet. Um, and we also just discussed the development of the percussion ensemble um, and percussion is instruments as an advent of the 20 and 21st centuries. Uh, we also talked a lot about the orchestra and we'll continue to talk a lot about the orchestra because a lot of very important rep repertoire, especially within the Western classical canon is written for that ensemble. Uh, most recently, we've talked about form uh, and that is structure, the idea of um, it, ideas repeating in a piece of music. We've talked about structure on the large scale, uh, things like sonata allegro form, uh, and the idea of, of a, a particular movement having two thematic ideas that play against one another. We've also talked about um, uh, repetition um, or form and structure in the melodic context, uh, taking a look at jazz uh, and the jazz standard, uh, both in terms of the, the melody, but also um, the sort of larger uh, form itself. And in general, what we found is that we have duplications on the larger scale also appear on the smaller scale. So we have all of these things ongoing. Um, there are uh, there's yet one more dimension of music that we're really going to try to focus on before we start listening to music that incorporates other visual elements, and that is harmony. We're going to talk about the sort of, um, we've talked about the horizontality of music, melody so far. We're going to talk about the verticality of music, the idea of ongoing um, is, uh, simultaneous pitches that are that are sounding at once. And of course, we've heard this in all of the examples that we've uh, covered so far this semester. Um, we've, we haven't listened to solely monophonic music. Of course, there's going to be uh, different pitches ongoing at one time. We just haven't necessarily given a name to it yet. So harmony is what we're going to mostly be investigating in this unit uh, through three particular or distinct lectures rather. Um, the first thing that we're gonna talk about, uh, we're gonna go back in history and talk about the classical era um, and uh, in particular talk about a, a school of composers called the first Viennese school. This is a good time for me to pull up my lecture notes um, and kind of walk you through a couple of particular uh, uh, sort of notable ideas regarding uh, harmony uh, and how it is constructed uh, in the functional sense, uh, how it normally works in the classical era um, and the Baroque era. Um, but uh, let me go ahead and pull those up and uh, sort of elaborate on some details here. Okay, so we are back at uh, lecture notes. Um, so where do we want to start? Uh, the first Viennese school. So the first Viennese school is a label that's given to three main composers of the 18th century that are really a part of the classical era. Uh, those composers are uh, Franz Joseph Haydn, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, and Ludwig von Beethoven. Um, so they all wrote pieces of music that uh, adhered to uh, functional rules. 
Um, and we're going to talk about what functional or uh, tonal music is. Uh, these composers, uh, they, they knew each other, but they didn't sit around to discuss any of these har harmony ideas with one another. Their advancements and ideas came fairly independently. Um, they definitely heard of each other's works and certainly that influenced um, uh, their own compositions by hearing uh, what was happening alongside of, of them. Um, but they, they generally uh, struck this particular balance between tonal or consonant uh, sonorities or um, events that are ongoing at one particular time and atonal or dissonant harmonies. Um, so uh, in, in general, when, I'm, when I think about functional harmony, I think about the perfect chocolate chip cookie. Uh, and if, uh, for those of you who have made chocolate chip cookies, hopefully you know that there is salt that's required in the recipe, just a little bit. Um, and the purpose of the salt, or in this case, it is analogous to dissonance, is to draw in actually the, the, the sweetness of, of, of the, the taste of the cookie by con contrast. The salt actually brings out the sweetness in the cookie itself. Um, and this is very similar to how functional harmony works. This idea that we have a little bit of dissonance that's in the context of something that's otherwise sweet and pleasing sounding. Um, and that is very, very uh, nice to our ears. We enjoy that very, very much. Um, so when a piece is functional, it means that there's a, a particular pitch though that we are, are returning to in a piece of music. And this is done by both the placement of the note, but also the reiteration of the note. Um, so when, and we've encountered this a number of times, what, but when a piece says it's in C major, it means that it actually uh, is going to be proportionally much more of the pitch C and two uh, other pitches that sort of help uh, it, uh, reinstate that as a harmonic idea, which is uh, uh, the third pitch of the scale happens to be me, um, or in this case, in this case of C major, the note E, if you guys can see my cursor, hopefully it's it's circled here in the example below. Um, and then the, the fifth pitch of this, the, the scale, uh, G, which is uh, so, so, um, do me so me do. Uh, those those three pitches uh, are are constantly reiterated to help reinforce the idea of C major. Um, so when I'm talking about a major scale, I'm talking about a construct of seven distinct pitches. Um, and in the case of a scale, the um, the the note name uh, that begins the scale uh, is the the note that that starts the scale itself so c major scale starts on the note c and has a particular sequence of half steps and whole steps um, to get you back to the note c at the um the eighth interval uh, which is indeed the interval of an octave um, the uh, the do re mi um hopefully you might or perhaps you know this from uh perhaps the, the, the sound of music, um, you do know, a deer, a female deer. Um, that, that, uh, that song uses a particular system called solfege. Um, and these note names help singers to uh, more accurately identify uh, pitches within the construct of a major scale. Um, so, like I said, the combination of do, mi, so, or one, three, and five uh, create what we call the major triad. And I sung it to you terribly, but uh, do, mi, so, mi, do, that, that's a, a major triad, poorly sung by your teacher, um, but it is the, the sort of basic harmony, like the, the most commonly reiterated harmony that we listen to in C major. I didn't necessarily start on the note C, by the way. I don't have perfect pitch. Um, however, uh, it, it, the, the relationship between note to note uh, or uh, for the collection was, was accurate, I promise. Um, so um, that, that major triad, the combination of these three notes that happen to be in the interval of, of a third away from one another, 
um, is the, the sort of basis of C major. So interval, let me unpack that word. So we're getting over here to the bottom of this page. Um, an interval is literally just the distance between one note and another note. Um, and in the case of C to E, um, C to D is uh, one step. If we're going to take that one step further, C to E is indeed the interval of a third. Um, C to F would be the interval of a fourth, C to G the interval of a fifth, and so forth. Um, uh, each interval, uh, just to complicate matters a little bit, comes in a different, uh, different qualities, by the way. Um, and one of the things, the re reason that the major uh, triad even sounds major is because it has the combination of two particular qualities of thirds. Um, those qualities are the major third followed by the minor third. Um, so uh, every single major triad has that construction. Every single major chord is the combination of a major third plus a minor third on the top. Um, so uh, the consistency uh, or the, the reason why we think something is in a major key is because the majority of the, um, the actual chords that we're listening to are going to be major in quality. Um, that doesn't mean that there are not minor chords. Uh, they just appear significantly less frequently. They're sort of like that salt in the chocolate chip cookie that I was talking about. Um, let's go ahead and move to the, the top of this page. So the chromatic scale. Um, there are other constructs beyond just the major scale. Um, and uh, the chromatic scale is uh, worth investigating because it happens to uh, show you the 12 distinct pitch classes that exist in a piece of music. So when I say 12 distinct pitch classes, if you were to have a piano in front of you and uh, ascend uh, going from one note to its next neighbor note, you would have uh, 12 distinct pitch classes, uh, 12 distinct notes before getting to the reiteration of C, if that is where you started in the first place. Um, um, the interval and quality of a pitch class is, um, uh, when it is the same note name, we call that an octave. So like a C to a C on the piano keyboard is the interval of an octave. Um, and one of the things that's particular about that particular note uh, distance from C to C is that it, uh, in terms of sound waves, it vibrates at um, double or half the, the rate of the um, initial note. So there's a ratio of essentially two to one that's happening there. Um, and a lot of times when, uh, like if I had a piano at the ready or we were in person and I were to play the note C and ask you guys to um, uh, match that pitch, a number, a number of you would reiterate that pitch in a different octave um, where it was comfortable for your vocal range. So there's a kind of transparency that exists within the octave or from moving from one pitch class to the next pitch class, like a C to another C. Um, one other thing that's really awesome about music is that we um, can re-spell notes. So they have uh, different kinds of, of, of contexts um, um, or mean something in different contexts. And, uh, in, in, the, in this um, chromatic scale, hopefully you notice that there are these bracketed notes um, where a C sharp and a D flat are bracketed together. And this is a, something we call an inharmonic equivalent. Um, it's where the note sounds the same, but it's spelled differently. Um, and uh, these exist in language as well. Um, we have like there, 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 we have many different spellings of the word there and they mean something different in 
different contexts uh, based on their spelling, uh, but we can figure that out in you know verbal language based on the context that they're used in the sentence for the most part. Um, but spelling um, really helps us in figuring out which one of those words that sounds the same uh, actually means what it means. Um, so enharmonic equivalents are quite fun. Like I said, they exist in language, but they certainly exist in music. And the reason that they do is because one spelling might be um, uh, show you how something functions in a particular key. That's a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of information. Um, but the thing that we're going to do, and I can stop sharing this for just a moment, we'll talk uh, again about functional harmony uh, at the beginning of our next example, um, or our first example, rather. So um, the thing that we're going to be doing is listening to three different examples of the first Viennese school who used um, tonal harmony. So they had this balance of, um, of, of major and minor chords uh, or moments of consonance and dissonance that help us know what notes are most important. Um, for right now, you know, it, music theory, by the way, which is most often just the study of music harmony, um, it is often taught within the music school, or at least at Brooklyn College, uh, in, in four, four stages. Um, uh, which, which are each a semester long. And uh, it seems that every musician continues their journey with uh, harmony and discussing harmony and thinking about harmony, uh, you know, through and beyond their education. So for the, the, the very base purposes of this class, the thing that I want you to know is that like in C major, the, the note that we're gonna hear most often is C. We're gonna hear a lot of the C major triad. And then we're gonna hear Additionally, um, other chords that help reinforce the importance of C major to help us identify that it is indeed in C major in the first place. And what we heard a little bit in Sonata Allegro form was this relationship between the tonic one and five, the dominant. There are these two kind of strongholds within the major mode construct. Um, and that's a lot of what we're going to hear within the compositions of Franz Joseph Haydn, uh, Mozart, uh, and, and Beethoven. So I've picked one piece from each composer uh, to further, uh, you know, it, uh, dive into and um, pick apart and hopefully hear as um, something that is indeed functional. Um, one thing that will help reinforce the idea of functionality is actually the next lecture, which talks about the second Viennese school, which is about the disestablishment of harmony in the first place, uh, where we're going to re-investigate uh, the, the chromatic scale and 12 individual pitches and serialism, but that's for our next lecture. So um, this concludes part one. Uh, for parts two, three, and four, we will listen to an example from each of these figureheads from the first Viennese school and figure out, um, you know, in addition to all of the other dimensions that I talked about at the very beginning of lecture, texture, rhythm, instrumentation, and form, while wow, we have four things now, um, uh, what's going on with the harmony and what we're going to hear for each of these three examples is that we're listening to functional harmony. Um, excellent, wonderful. So I will see you guys back for part two shortly.